Jesus is giving us in this Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25, the signs of His coming. And we need to remind ourselves almost weekly when we go through this section of Scripture that it's a response that Jesus gave based on three questions that were asked in verse 3. Look at it with me in your Bible, 24-3. The disciples asked Jesus, when shall these things be? That is, when shall Jerusalem be destroyed? Then the second question, what should be the sign of your coming? That is the second coming. What signs will precede your second advent? And then, and of the end of the age. The word is ionios, or age, the Jewish age. So three questions. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? Now all the way through this series, I keep reminding you that when they ask what are the signs of your coming, they are asking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. They're not asking about the rapture. They're asking about the second coming. Now you might say, well, what do you mean by rapture? What's the rapture? The rapture is an event by which Christ will descend from heaven and the dead who have died in Christ, their bodies will be resurrected. Those who are alive and remain, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, will be raptured. The Greek word is heart podzo, or caught up, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we forever be with the Lord. Now the reason I say this is because I want to be absolutely clear that everything we're going to read about today in this passage in its primary interpretation is not about the rapture, it's about the second coming. And it's written to those who are alive during the tribulation after the rapture, and will be here on earth when Christ returns. All the signs in the Olivet Discourse about His coming are signs in the tribulation that will precede His second coming. So you need to keep these clear. A lot of confusion today. People take rapture verses and they combine them with second coming verses or they don't believe in a rapture, they believe in a second coming. and Just a lot of confusion. Jesus introduced the rapture in, in John 14 When he said, I go to prepare a place and I'll come again and I'll receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and it starts at verse 51, Paul the Apostle says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all die, but we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And he said, This corruptible, referring to his body, will put on incorruption. This mortal body will put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death swallowed up in victory. Oh grave, where is thy sting? Oh oh, sin, where is thy victory? So Jesus is coming back to rapture. Then the classic rapture passage, and by the way, at the end of this series, The Return of the King, I'm going to do an in-depth teaching on the rapture of the church. But the classic passage is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and it starts at verse 13 where Paul says to the believers in Thessalonica, I don't want you to sorrow about your loved ones who have died and be ignorant about those that have died, that you have no hope. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus, God will bring with Him. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Use the word heart, podzo, means to be raptured or caught up. So those are the classic rapture passages But we're not talking about the rapture at all in these verses. You go, you told us all that to tell us it's not in our verses? Yes. Because I want you to keep them separate and distinct. The rapture will happen. There will be seven years of tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, Christ comes back in second power, in a second coming in power and glory. Now, in verse 32 to verse 36, I'm just warming up to the passage. He gave us the parable of the fig tree. And the parable of the fig tree is intended to tell us that those who are living during the time of the tribulation, when they see those signs, they'll know that Christ's coming, His second coming, is nigh even at the door. And then He gave us in verse 37 to verse 41 the story of Noah and the days of Noah. That as God told Noah to build a boat, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage. The wicked of Noah's day didn't expect a flood to come. 
And it wasn't until Noah went into the ark and God shut the door and the rains came down that God said that, that, that the Scriptures say that Noah was safe in the ark and all those wicked were swept away unexpectedly. They weren't looking for the coming of the Lord. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, but they weren't living in expectation and readiness. So now the question is that Jesus is answering is, are you ready for His return? I want you to see the key verse, verse 44. In verse 44 of Matthew 24, Therefore be ye also ready. There it is. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. When he says the Son of Man comes, he's referring to His second coming. His second advent at the end of the tribulation period. So Jesus, now in a series of parables, teaches us the importance of being ready for His return. Basically, whenever you have a parable, a parable has one main lesson. And that one main lesson in these parables is that we should be ready. So he gives us three parables today. The thief, watchfulness, the servants, faithfulness, and the ten virgins. The lesson is readiness. So we're going to look at three stories. The thief teaching us to be watchful. The servants teaching us to be faithful and the ten virgins, Matthew 25, verses 1-13, to that we should be ready for His return. Let's look first at this parable of the thief, verse 42, down to verse 44. Follow with me in your Bible. Jesus says, Watch therefore, for ye know not the hour when the Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in which, in which watch or time of the night the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Here's the point. Therefore, be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man is coming. Now I want you to understand that as far as prophecy and signs and chronological order is concerned, this is a parenthesis. This is a parenthetical section where he actually is telling us parables basically to teach us to be ready for his return. Now notice in verse 42, we have the principle. Watch therefore. By the way, lest I forget, if you look down in chapter 25 and verse 13, it opens with the same statement. Watch therefore. So basically he's saying the same thing in all of these verses. Be awake, be alert, be watchful. So watch therefore, which takes us back to the days of Noah, when they weren't expecting the flood to come and they were all swept away in judgment. So you need to watch and you need to be ready. And as I said, the word watch there means to be keeping your eyes wide open. Why? Because you know not what hour the Lord doth come. So He gives us the principle in verse 42. You must stay awake. You must stay alert. You must not go to sleep. Now, it has its first and primary application to the Jews, Israel, and the tribulation saints, people who miss the rapture but are here in the tribulation. They'll turn to God. They'll trust in Jesus. They'll be looking for His return. But they need to stay alert. They need to keep watching. Now, the parables in verse 43. But know this, that if the good men of the house, that's the head of the household, the head who owns the home, if he had known in which, not, which watch, now the watch there is the time of night. They had different watches through the night in the Roman reckoning. If he knew what time, the thief would come. This is a story about a thief coming to rob a house. Then he would have watched, the word there means to be on guard, and would not have allowed his house to be broken up. And then in verse 44 is the practice. Here's the application. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man, that messianic title for Jesus, He will come again. Now, the interesting picture there is that of the thief. How many of you ever had someone rob you? Had your car broken into? Had your house broken into? Have a son-in-law that was out surfing and someone saw him hide his keys and he, they broke into his car, took his keys, 
took his wallet, took all his credit cards, locked up his car, and left with the keys. So it was a real nightmare to try to, try to get that all sorted out. And I, I've had similar things happen, or maybe you come back to your car and a window's broken out, and someone has robbed you and you feel so violated, or maybe someone's robbed your house, you come home and you find a back door open or a window broken, they've come in to rob you. So Jesus says, just like a thief that comes in, if you knew when the thief was coming, you would be watching and waiting and it wouldn't happen, right? That's because thieves don't call you and tell you when they're going to rip you off. It would be the considerate thing for them to do. It would be the nice thing for them to do. Mr. Miller, yes. Yeah, we've been casing your house and we want you to leave your key under the floor mat because Saturday night about 3 a.m. we're going to break in and rob your house, okay? Okay, great, got it. I mean, you're going to be waiting with your guard dogs, your shotgun, the police department, the FBI, the CIA. And you're going to be waiting for them because you know when they're coming. So the thought here is, it's very simple, thieves come unexpectedly. You don't expect a thief to come. You're not ready for them to come. The other day I walked out of a store and I thought someone stole my car. It was gone. Like, whoa, I'm freaking out. And then I realized, no, I parked it over here. <laughs> Pray for me. Pastor needs help. He doesn't know where he parks his car. I was like, oh no, someone stole my car. And I'm all freaking out. And he's like, oh no, it's over here. But Jesus said, it's like a thief. Now, let me make something clear. Jesus is not a thief. Okay? He's coming like a thief. He's just using a story to illustrate, you won't be expecting me when I come. That's the theme through all of these parables. When you are not expecting it, the Lord will come. Now, I want to make this very clear. One of my goals in teaching through the Olivet Discourse is just to be clear, to explain the passage. And in its primary interpretation... It's not referring to the church living today waiting for the rapture. It's talking about Jews who will be on the earth during the tribulation. Some actually say that Jesus is leading up to the parable of the virgins in chapter 25 in which He will judge Israel. The true Israel will be saved and those who reject Messiah will be lost in the picture of the wise and the foolish virgins. But you know, after the rapture, many Jews will turn to Jesus. Many Gentiles will turn to Jesus. And there will be a time of great evangelism and people will be saved. People have this false idea that the Holy Spirit leaves during the tribulation. Not so. He will be actively working and people will be being saved and coming to Christ and salvation during that time. So he's telling these people who are alive on the earth just before the second coming, during the tribulation, that they should be living in expectancy and looking for the coming again of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, Pastor John, it doesn't have any application to us as the church. Only in a secondary sense of that we don't know when the rapture is going to happen. Now, the difference between the second coming and the rapture is the rapture is imminent. That means nothing has to happen before we get raptured. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're not looking for the sun to turn to blackness. We're not looking for the moon to turn to blood. We're not looking for signs. We're looking for the Savior. And Jesus Christ could come and rapture us before the sermon is over this morning. I could dig that, couldn't you? I'm ready to go. When you love Jesus and you're living close to the Lord, any time is a good time to get raptured and be with Jesus Christ. But He's not talking to us but it does have application. You need to be ready. If the rapture happened this morning, would you get caught up? Then you say, well, how do I get ready? You get born again. That's what you do. We studied it on Wednesday night. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be what? Born again. Which means you must be born from above. Your race won't get you into heaven, Nicodemus. I know you're a Jew, but that doesn't get you to heaven. Your, your, your religion won't get you to heaven, Nicodemus. You can't go by your own religion or righteousness. Not by works of righteousness. How are we born again? Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must I, the Son of Man, be lifted up. 
But whoever believes in Him should never perish, but have everlasting life. And then it goes on to say, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should never perish, but have everlasting life. How do you get ready for the Lord to rapture you? You get born again by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. You must turn from your sin. You must believe that He died for you by receiving Him through faith. It's an act of your will by saying, I trust You, Jesus. I believe in You, Jesus. Come into my heart. Forgive my sins. And make me Your Savior. Now, I want you to hold your place here in Matthew 24 and flip real quick. I can't resist it. And look at 1 Thessalonians 5. And we're going to read verses 1-8. to 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1-8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. These are a marvelous parallel passage that gives application and clarity to the church. He says, But of the times and the seasons, verse 1, brethren, he's writing to Christians, you have no need that I write unto you. Now, when he's talking to the church, he says, I, I don't need to tell you the chronology. I don't need to tell you the characteristics, the seasons. I, I've already taught you about the signs of the end time. He says, For you yourselves know perfectly, verse 2, that the day of the Lord will come and here's our term, like a thief in the night. Now that day of the Lord is not the rapture here, it's the tribulation. He's saying the tribulation period will come like a thief in the night. And he says, when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not Escape. Now, I'm, I'm trying to resist the temptation to do exposition on these verses. But I do want to point something out in verse 3. They, them, and they. They shall say, peace and safety. Sudden destruction comes upon them as a woman with child. And they shall not escape. And then notice the change in verse 4. But ye brethren... So he's talking in verse 3 about non-Christians, unbelievers, who will be caught by the thief. They will go into the tribulation period. But you, he's talking to the church, the believers, that day will not overtake you as a thief. Now, notice these characteristics of this tribulation period. It comes like a thief in the night, verse 2. It starts with peace and safety. Antichrist makes a covenant of peace with the nation of Israel for seven years. And then sudden destruction comes upon them. In the middle of the tribulation, there's the abomination of desolation as upon a woman with child. And then notice the fourth characteristic, verse 3. They shall not escape. There's no escaping this day of the Lord, this tribulation that's coming upon the earth. But that day will not overtake us as the church. Why, verse 5? You're the children of the light. You're the children of the day. We're not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us who let us not sleep as do others. Because we're children of the day, we're not sleeping. Because we're children of the day, let us watch and be sober. Verse 6. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. That is the hope of one day we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now all of these verses there in Thessalonians, Paul is saying we're children of the day. So we're not going to go through the tribulation. We're children of the light. We're not going to be caught unawares by that thief. But the idea is we need to live watchfully. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. So here's the main lesson of the first parable of the thief. Watch out. Be alert. Stay awake. If you knew someone was going to rob your house, you would be awake, alert, and watching to prevent that. Now he gives us a second story or parable. It's in verse 45 to 51. It's of the two servants. One is faithful. The other one is faithless. Called an evil servant servant. Let's read the passage. 
He says, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to do something, to give them their food in due season. So it's the picture of a steward. Blessed or happy is that servant, verse 46, whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find him doing. That's the idea that you're busy, you're faithful, you're doing what God has called you to do. Verily or truly, I say unto you, verse 47, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. And when we are faithful in the small things, God will give us more things. And we stand before that bema, we will be rewarded. But notice we have then the evil servant, verse 48. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. That's what you don't want to do. You don't want to forget about it. You don't want to live in apathy or complacency. You don't want to mock the idea of the coming again of Christ. You, you, you want to live in light of the Lord's coming. But this evil servant is motivated because he says, oh, the Lord delays his coming. And what he does is begin to smite his fellow servants and begin to eat and drink with the drunken. Remember we just read in 1 Thessalonians 5 that we're children of the day, so we're not sleeping. We're children of the day, so we're not drunk. We're sober and we're awake. But notice verse 50. For the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him, and in an hour when he's not aware of, and he shall cut him asunder. And this is pretty graphic language. And get, remember, Jesus is speaking here. It's in red, indicating in the Lord speaking. Shall cut him asunder. Actually means saw him in two. And appoint him as portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's no other way to interpret this other than Jesus saying they go to hell. They're lost. They reject Messiah. When He returns, they will be judged. They will be the tares, not the wheat. They will be the goats, not the sheep. And we're going to get into that in chapter 25. Now, Jesus tells the story of a homeowner. And he's a wealthy man. He's got all these servants. He's going to take a trip. And so he gives the servant the job. When I'm gone, I want you to basically feed the household. I want you to pay the bills. I want you to take care of everything, feed the servants, feed the household. And the first servant is faithful. He does what his master required him to do. And he knew that his master would come back and there would be a day of reckoning. Then the second servant says, ah, he's not coming back for a long time. He's not going to come back. There's no... So he began to get drunk. He began to eat. He began to hang out. He began to smite his fellow servants. He wasn't faithful. So when the master comes back, he rewards the faithful servant, but he punishes the unfaithful, evil servant. Now again, the application is when Jesus comes back in His second coming, those believers on earth during the time of the tribulation made up of Jews and Gentiles who are looking for and serving and faithful that Christ is coming again, when all hell is breaking loose on earth, they're fixed on a city whose maker and builder is God. And so should we be. But the evil servant, he says, no, the Lord's not coming back. Remember the days of Noah? We just saw that in context. They were eating. They were drinking. They were marrying. They were giving in marriage. They were going to soccer games. That's not in the Greek. I just threw that in there. <laughs> going to the movies, going on vacation, buying new cars, buying houses. Having, all of which are fine. I've done my share of soccer, believe me, raising my kids. Those things are all great. But they were living as though the Lord would not come again. They were living like the flood wouldn't come. And they didn't realize it. They got caught unexpectedly until Noah entered in the ark and the door was shut and the rain started coming down. And then they beat upon the ark, let us in, let us in. But it was too late. They weren't watching. They weren't working. They weren't faithful. They weren't ready. Now, they, you're not going to work for your salvation. We're saved by grace. But if you're truly saved, you're going to show it by the way that you live 
your life. Write down Ephesians 2, verse 10. Right after telling us we're saved by grace through faith, Paul says, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So first lesson is be watchful or stay awake. Beloved, don't go to sleep. The second exhortation is be faithful. Let's roll up our sleeves and work while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. Remember I told you one of the reasons we study Bible prophecy is it compels us. It compels us to witness to my family, to witness to my neighbors, to witness to my co-workers, to pray, to give, to serve, to do all I can to reach people because Christ is coming again. So we are to be faithful until He comes. Now there's a third story, clearly a parable. It's called commonly the parable of the ten virgins. And without skipping a beat, chapter 24 flows right into chapter 25. There are no chapter verse divisions in the original. We have the story of the ten virgins, verse 1. Then, when, when Christ comes back in power and glory, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, and they went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. We get our word moronic from that word foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. Now they had lamps. They were virgins. They had lamps, and their lamps had oil, but they didn't have any backup oil. So when their lamps went out, they didn't have enough when the bridegroom shows up, and they are lost. So it says, the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom's coming. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those rose, the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Literally, they're going out. And the wise answered, said, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and for you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went, here's the key text, verse 10. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came. They missed the bridegroom. And they, were, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So those that were ready got to go into the marriage feast. Afterward came also the other virgins, verse 11, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Here it is again. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man is coming. Now again, I, I, I want to be faithful to the text. He's not talking about the rapture. So he's not really talking to the church. It has a secondary application to us because we need to be ready for the rapture. But he's talking about the tribulation period. And he's talking about Jews who turn to Christ, but those who don't turn to Christ, whether Jew or Gentile. But I think the primary focus of this parable of the virgins is that these are Jews who don't believe in Jesus. And even though they're in the tribulation, experiencing the time of Jacob's trouble, they don't trust the Lord, look to the Lord. They're not expecting the Lord. And they are cast into hell. So very important to keep that in proper perspective. Now, I want to make it clear that the virgins don't represent the church. Yes, the church is the virgin bride of Christ. And yes, in the rapture, He's coming back to take the church. But when the rapture happens, I didn't share this first service. I'm going to share it with second because I like you guys better and I won't charge you anything more. <laughs> But based on this parable, he is not, he is not, he is not teaching a partial rapture teaching. At the end of my series, I'm going to do an in-depth study on the rapture because I want you to understand it. When the rapture happens, if you're saved, you're going up. If you're not saved, you're not going up. It's not for the super saints. 
It's not the rapture isn't for the deeper life club. I heard a preacher once say that if you, when the rapture happened, if you weren't actually looking up, the minute it happened, you wouldn't be raptured. I thought, that's insane. How do you know a Christian? Just look at him. He's always walking around like this. That's just flat out stupid, okay? It's not biblical. If you're saved, you're a part of the church. You're born again. You're a child of God. You're going to get raptured. You're going to get caught up to be with the Lord. Don't sweat it. doesn't mean you have to pray 10 hours a day in hopes that you'll get raptured. You're going to get raptured. But during the tribulation, there'll be people who won't believe in Jesus, won't trust Him. They'll be like the foolish virgins who won't be prepared and they will be lost when the Lord returns. And you say, well, does it really have any application for us today? Well, yes, it does. And that is we as the church do need to be ready for the rapture. But that's not what the text is talking about. Now, remember, the thief doesn't announce when he comes, right? You know, in the weddings, in, in the Bible days, my wife and I went to a wedding uh, um, Friday night. Weddings are always beautiful. Weddings are always fun. Weddings are always glorious. And the bride's always beautiful. The grooms sometimes need help. <laughs> Not in this case, but it was a beautiful wedding. But in the Bible days, you never knew when the wedding was going to actually happen. Because a couple would be espoused, and for one year they would be legally bound in an espousal period. We call it an engagement, but that's not a legal binding. They would be espoused. And anywhere during that one year espoused at the end, the wedding could happen. So what happened was, is you had to actually be ready for the bridegroom comes pick you up. Now, this parable is not about the bridegroom, and it's not about the bride. It's about the bridesmaids. These virgins are, would be called bridesmaids. And they have to be ready. So what happens is any time, they didn't know when, the groom would come with his bride, and they would pick up the bridesmaids, and then they would go in a procession through the night with their lamps, and they would go to the place where the wedding feast was going to happen, the wedding ceremony, and they would have the wedding ceremony and then the wedding feast. You know how long it lasted? One week. Now, in our weddings today, you have the wedding, you have the ceremony, the bride and groom, let's get out of here, let's boogie, let's split, let's go. Remember when I got married, it's like, let's hit the road, let's get out of here, let's get the show going. So my wife and I jumped in my 66 VW bus. <laughs> On our honeymoon, you know, you know, get out and pedal so we can go. And we're about halfway to our destination, and boom, the front tires blew up. I wasn't ready. If I had it to do over again, I'd get a lot nicer car to take my wife on the honeymoon to. What can you say? Poor preacher hippie boy. But in those days, the groom would show up. The groomsman's here, and they have to wake up. Now, if you woke me up at midnight, I'd say, I ain't going to your wedding. Forget it. I'm sleeping. Leave me alone. And so they light their lamps. Now, their lamps weren't torches. Their lamps weren't pirate lamps. They were like little Aladdin lamps made out of clay, filled with olive oil, and had a wick coming out the end. Like, like, kind of like a little Aladdin lamp, perhaps. They would fill it with olive oil, and they would light the wick. Now, there's interesting similarities. They were all the bridesmaids' virgins. They all had lamps. They all knew the bridegroom was coming, but only five were ready. And the other five were foolish because they didn't have extra oil. So their lamps burnt out. The other women had lamp oil, and they refilled their lamps, and their lamps kept burning bright, and they were living in expectancy. They, they were living in preparedness. They, they knew that it could happen any time. It's kind of like when someone says, hey, I'm coming over Saturday. What time are you coming? Oh, just sometime Saturday. Well, can you be more specific? No, I'll just be ready. I'll, I'll come by and pick you up. I called someone once and talked to a, I was returning a call to a friend, and his wife said he's in the shower. I thought, well, how long does he shower? Because I want to take a shower myself, right? I remember, I remember I needed to jump in the shower. So I'm like, do I just wait, not shower, knowing that he'll get out of the shower, call me, or I'll be in the shower, I'll miss him, and I have to call him back? I, 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 I really freaked out over this. 
So I was basically like just, okay, okay, I'll just wait, you know, I don't get to take my shower because I'm waiting for him to finish his shower. But I had to wait and expect it. Like someone would say, I'll call you back. And then, you know, they just, well, when are you going to call me back? You don't want to get preoccupied with other things. So the idea, and this is the way we ought to live as Christians. Jesus is coming, and we don't know when, so we need to be living in constant expectation of His coming. Amen? So in verse 10, he drives home the point. He said, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. They that were ready went in with Him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Those who weren't ready came later, Lord, Lord. Jesus in Matthew 7 said, there's going to be that day when they say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do wonderful works in your name? Didn't we perform miracles in your name? And Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you intimately. I didn't have a personal relationship with you. So watch, therefore, verse 13, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Lord comes. Now, I want you to turn to Romans 13. I have one last verse to close with, which is again in the epistles, a picture that applies to us as the church. Romans 13, verse 11 to 14. I want you to remember these cross-references. Romans 13, 11 to 14. Paul says, and that knowing the time, verse 11, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly. Here's how he tells us to live. Honestly or living appropriately as in the day. Not in rioting. Not in drunkenness. Not in chambering, which is sexual immorality. Not in wantonness, which is sensuality. Not in strife or in envies. But what you should do, verse 14, is put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. This is one of the most important cross-references for how we should then live as Christians. Make no provision for the flesh. Jesus is coming again. It's no time to be going out getting drunk. It's no time to be sleeping around. It's no time to be living for the world. It's no time to be living lackadaisical and carnal, carnally and, and apathetically. It's time to be watching. It's time to be working. And it's time to be ready for the Lord's return. So very, very important. Be watchful. He's coming. He's coming. Be faithful, serving Him with the gifts and the talents that God has given you. Be ready. Don't be like the foolish virgins. You know, in the Bible, the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So you need to be born again. The best way to be ready is to be born again is to have the Spirit of God living inside of you. And the only way to be born again is by faith in Jesus Christ. If you're not born again, then you're not saved. If you're not saved, you're not going to get raptured and you'll be here for the tribulation. If you want to get caught up to meet the Lord, then you need to be born again. Just as Nicodemus was told, you have to be born again. You have to be born again. And how are we born again? Is Jesus died on the cross? You trust Him and Him alone for your salvation. Jesus died for you. Jesus was buried and Jesus rose from the dead. And it's only through faith in Christ that we can be forgiven and we can be prepared. So we put on the breastplate of faith and love. We put on the helmet. It's the hope of salvation. You say, well, I thought we're already saved the moment we believed in Jesus. We've been saved, justification. We're being saved, sanctification. And we will be, future tense, saved. Glorification. That's what Paul means when he says, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. I don't know about you, but as I've studied these verses these last several weeks, my heart 
has been stirred once again to live in expectancy and hope. Christ is coming again. Amen. If God has spoken to you through this message today and you're not sure that you're a child of God, maybe you don't know for sure that if you died today that you would go to heaven. You've never really trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I would like to lead you in a prayer right now, inviting Christ to come into your heart and to be your Savior. So as I pray this prayer, I want you to repeat it out loud right where you are after me. Make it from your heart, inviting Christ to come in and be your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I pray that you'll forgive me and come into my heart and make me your child. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. I believe in you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God heard that prayer, and I believe that God will and does forgive your sins. We'd like to help you get started growing in your walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you. If you just prayed with Pastor John to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we are so excited for you. And we'd like to send you a Bible and some resources to get you started in your relationship with the Lord. Simply click on the contact link at the top of the page and tell us something like, I prayed to accept Christ. We'll get your Bible and resources mailed out to you right away. God bless you and welcome to the family of God.